As you guys can see, we're in a slightly different setup, but this is the third setup I was talking about. My little blue screen, it's a little dark, it's a little moody, because today we're gonna be talking about Mass Effect. Woo! I tried to do as much of a little space theme as I could with my makeup the short amount of time that I have this week to do this. And then if it all works out, hopefully maybe there's space behind me. And if it isn't, I think this fits the theme. So welcome to Mia Likes Movies. My name is Mia. Um, Yeah, I, I like movies. I do. I like some other stuff too, but Mia Likes Movies just sounded the best. So as the title of the video suggests, we will be talking about the upcoming TV adaptation of Mass Effect. If you don't know what Mass Effect is, Mass Effect is one of probably the most iconic role-playing games of all time. The first game released all the way back in 2007 for the Xbox 360. Just for context, I was um, eight years old. To put it simply, the series has defined a generation of games and continues to influence the industry to this day. Personally, I didn't get into the series until 2021 when the Legendary Edition came out. For those of you who don't know, the Legendary Edition is kind of like a remaster of the entire trilogy plus the DLC. That being said, it has quickly become one of my favorite game series of all time. It truly is a masterpiece in storytelling and role-playing and it deserves all of the hype that it gets. Of course, between the massive success of the game series and its inherent focus on story and lore, executives and producers in Hollywood took note. Rumors of a screen adaptation were swirling all the way back in 2010. Deadline reported that Legendary Pictures obtained the rights and they were going to work with Warner Brothers as their distributor. They even had a screenwriter potentially attached, Mark Protasevich. He helped with the story for Thor for Marvel Entertainment. Obviously, this did not work out and the idea kind of faded into the background for several years. After all, when the aforementioned Deadline article dropped, the second game in the series, Mass Effect 2, had only been out for about four months. I think we should all be grateful that the movie ended up not being made. Casey Hudson, who is credited as the creator of Mass Effect the series, had always intended to make the series a trilogy, and they developed the games with this overarching story in mind. And like most movie adaptations, a lot of content and lore in the games would have had to be cut to fit time constraints. And if you haven't played the games before, you truly cannot fathom how much fucking lore there is in this game. The, the codexes are intense, to say the least. While the first game has a strong focus on a singular main plot point, the other games do not necessarily follow the same formula. So by the time they would have started to adapt the sequels to the big screen, they probably would have had to cut even more content to make a plot that even makes any sense for film. However, like I said, this adaptation ended up not working out and fans kind of just accepted that there wasn't going to be any sort of adaptation at all. That is just until a couple years ago, rumors started swirling that Amazon Studios would be trying to obtain the right for Mass Effect around um, late 2022, which is a little over a year after the release of the Legendary Edition. Amazon Studios has been really exploring fantasy lately, especially with their recent releases of series adaptations of The Wheel of Time and Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power. Jennifer Sulky, the head of Amazon Studios, said that we will see them continue to, quote, invest in fantasy genre of all kinds end quote, and that we can expect more of this in the future. While both of these adaptations saw massive amounts of views and ratings, they had relatively mediocre reviews compared to the 8.8 .8 out of 10 that The Last of Us has and the 8.1 that The Witcher has on IMDb. The Wheel of Time and The Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power are sitting at a comfortable 7.1 and 7 out of 10 respectively, which is not horrible, but when you hear a 7 versus when you hear an 8.8, .8, it is a huge difference. While some of this is purely due to racism and bigotry. I'm looking at you, Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power fans. You guys were absolutely horrible to those hobbits. Why can't hobbits be black? Jesus. But I do think that overall, this does raise some questions about what Oh, the girls are fighting. However, I do think this raises some questions about what we can expect from Amazon Studios for Mass Effect. If this is the reaction to their dip in fantasy, what will it be when they start to explore more science fantasy or science fiction? Are they the right studios to tackle this galactic beast? Honestly, I have, I have mixed feelings. 
One thing that I found in my research for this video is that Amazon Studios is currently producing an adaptation of the Fallout series. This gives me some comfort in a way as they can almost work out some of the sci-fi growing pains with this adaptation. Geneva Robert Dwarit, a writer on both the most recent Tomb Raider film as well as Captain Marvel, will serve as showrunner along with Graham Wagner who was on Silicon Valley. The creators behind Westworld are also acting as executive producers and this is a really stacked team. And with a teaser picture released in October 2022, we can expect this to come to our screen soon. Allegedly filming wrapped earlier this year. Admittingly though, I'm not a huge fan of Fallout. I've just never played so I can't speak to any part of it at all. That being said, if they can procure this sort of team for Fallout, I am sure we can see a team of equivalent or even more talent and expertise for Mass Effect. I truly and honestly believe that the reception of the Fallout adaptation will decide if, when, and how we will get a Mass Effect series because even if a studio obtains the rights for something, it doesn't mean that they'll necessarily make it. So maybe they're just holding on to see the reaction to their Fallout adaptation to see if they will do Mass Effect. Before we move on, I just want to do one more side note here. I actually have a lot of issues with the look of a lot of Amazon Studios films and television series. The reason why I don't really watch them, I never finished Wheel of Time or Rings of Power and I genuinely haven't even touched the boys. The cinematography is beautiful, don't get me wrong, but I find the color grading of these beautiful shots always seems to dull the colors too much or they oversaturate them. There's no in between. For example, uh, look at this scene uh, from the boys. Notice how the colors feel more dull and gray overall. Like the shot itself is beautiful with the mirrors and Homelander's absolutely gorgeous costumes seem to come to life in front of all of the mirrors. I understand that the coloring is to reflect the genre of this edgy and dystopian view of superheroes, but it doesn't excite me as a viewer. It looks like one of those filters that they used in the early 2000s for like Middle Eastern war movies, but instead of this warm disgusting wash of yellow, we get this cool tone gray disaster, if that's a adequate metaphor. <laughs> you can have your cinematography and color grading reflect the genre without compromising the set or costume design. Just look at the adaptation of The Watchmen, for example. This is another dystopian take on superheroes, but they let the shot reflect the genre without turning it into this giant gray mush. I would just hate to see the beauty of Mass Effect's setting be flattened by falling victim to the Amazon Studios filter. In my opinion, I would much rather see HBO tackle this adaptation rather than Amazon Studios, but that just doesn't seem to be our current reality. I had to put one of those baby sensory videos on for my dog. So that's how my life's going. So that was a lot of information, but let's talk about why we're actually here today, right? Mass Effect. At this time, the series has not moved into pre-production. We don't even have a director or screenwriter attached to the project. PC Gamer speculates that we may not actually see the series until 2025 at the earliest. We can't really speculate anything about the series since there is literally nothing to speculate about. And honestly, that is fine with me. I'm not here to speculate. I actually really, really want to talk about why I don't think a television adaptation will work. I think it'll work more than a movie adaptation and I will still watch it. I just don't think a television adaptation or any adaptation can do justice to this series. There are just some things that can't be adapted to a different medium and I truly believe that Mass Effect is one of them. First of all, which I already sort of touched on already, is that the story, lore, and world of Mass Effect is massive. Let's dig a little into the story, shall we? The first of the game series, Mass Effect 1, takes place in the year 2183 within the Milky Way galaxy. You play as Commander Shepard, whose background, history, gender, and fighting class are all up to you, the player. You are the commander of the ship known as the SSV Normandy, a Systems Alliance starship. Systems Alliance is the representative body of Earth and all human colonies in Citadel space. The term Citadel space refers to the parts of space within the Citadel Council's rule. And the Council is a governmental body and alliance, lowercase a, 
between the prominent alien races in space. They entered this agreement to create peace within space and those who inhabit it. Only three races are represented on the council, the Asari, the Turians, and the Solarians. At this point in the story, humans do not have a spot on the Citadel Council. However, they do have an ambassador on the Citadel Space Station where the Citadel Council is stationed. That ambassador is a dick and his name is Udina and I hate him. <laughs> also, do you notice how complicated it is just to set up the inciting incident. Like, I haven't even gotten to the opening mission before the main plot starts. So at the beginning of the game, Commander Shepard and fellow Normandy crew member Caden are sent to investigate and recover a Prothean beacon that was found on the human colony of Eden Prime. The Protheans are an ancient alien race that mysteriously vanished 50,000 years prior to the events of the game. Not a lot is known about the Protheans, but many of their artifacts and technology were left behind from their disappearance. They were credited with the creation of not only the Citadel space station, but also the mass relays, which what makes intergalactic travel possible. Accompanying Caden and Shepard are another member of the Normandy crew and a Turing inspector known as Nylas. Inspector stands for Special Tactics and Reconnaissance. Special agents for the Citadel Council that are given essentially free reign over the galaxy. They can pretty much go wherever and do whatever they want, and they're tasked with preserving galactic stability by whatever means necessary. I stole that from the fandom wiki. Nihilus goes ahead of us to scope out the route to the Prothean Beacon, and we are attacked by Geth. And basically we have to fight a bunch of geth and geth are these non-organic alien species and our third party member dies from the geth attack rest in peace I stumble upon the infamous space racist ashley and she essentially takes that dead guy's place and while fighting through all these geth we eventually make it to the beacon there's another specter turi in there and his name's saren he'll become very important later or this is when he starts to become important saren murders nihilus Rest in peace, Nihilus. Saren activates the Prothean beacon and leaves. In the chaos, Shepard ends up accidentally touching the beacon, gets a vision of like war and death, and it's really hard to decipher. And it's so much that Shepard passes out. R.I.P. Shepard. Just kidding. Uh, uh, they don't die there. That's Mass Effect 2. So all of that takes us to the official main plot of the first game. Council is reluctant to trust Shepard's story of Saren committing treason because they, they like Saren more. And he's a Turian and there's a Turian on the council, so... So in order to prove that Saren is a dick, you have to find some people in the Citadel space station who uh, can vouch for you. So you befriend Tali, Garrus, and Rex, all of whom provide some details or evidence that prove that Saren is treasonous. Eventually the council complies and believes your story at least a little bit, and they give Shepard Spectre status to take down Saren. Commander Shepard is then given full command of the Normandy ship as your former captain, uh, Captain David Anderson, steps down, thus allowing you. Shepard to become captain. Tally, Garrus, and Rex all join your squad to take down Saren as well. So the rest of the missions you can kind of do in whatever order you like. There's like a suggested order, but you don't really have to do them like that. There's like three main missions that you have to do for the plot. On one mission, you rescue a researcher named Liara, who helps Shepard translate the message from the beacon. Liara has been studying Prothean technology and artifacts for hundreds of years. She also happens to be the daughter of Matriarch Benezia, who's working for and with Saren. On another mission, Shepard takes down Benezia, who reveals that Saren is working with the Reapers. Basically, the Reapers are a race of sentient spaceships that kill organic life every 50,000 years. And Saren is basically teaming up with them in order to get on their good side. And you know, I didn't really want to get this detailed into the plot, but eh, here we are. Might as well continue. On a different mission, we learn that Saren has created a cure for the Krogan genophage. And the Krogans, Rex is one of them. They're a race of aliens that are considered to be extremely violent and they can reproduce at an extremely fast rate. So they were deemed an extreme threat to the galaxy and specifically to the Citadel. So they created a biological weapon to keep them from reproducing quickly and Saren created a cure against this genophage to mass produce Krogans for the Reaper army. So you and Rex get into a fight because he is like this can help my people. So you can either kill Rex and move along with the mission or you can try and have him understand that although the idea of a cure to the genophage is great maybe not at the expense of um 
Sarah and the Reaper is pro- possibly um, killing everyone. So during the same mission, you also have to choose between saving Caden or Ashley. And I say choose loosely because obviously you let Ashley, the space racist, die every time. Everyone hates Ashley. Some more shit happens, and eventually you find out that the Citadel space station is one of those aforementioned mass relays, and Sovereign, the Reaper that Saren is working with, wants to use the Citadel to invade the farther galaxy. In the final battle of the game, you uh, fight on the Citadel through mass forces of Geth. You get to choose whether the Alliance army saves the fleeing council at the expense of more human casualties, or you can let the council die and then less humans die and then the human alliance comes to your aid instead up to you and then you confront saren and he can either kill himself or he enters a fight with you saren dies regardless but then sovereign reanimates his body and you have to fight him again and it's really gross and he's like this gross spider and it took me forever to beat him but eventually you destroy saren's body sovereign gets incapacitated and the alliance gets to finish the job by actually killing the spaceship if you save the council they reward humanity by giving them a spot on the council then you get to decide if your former captain anderson will get to join the council or if that dickhole udina will if you let the council die you get to choose which of these to get to take their place essentially as they form a new council and they're like the leader regardless the game ends with shepherd leaving with your chosen leader vowing to and the reapers for good the end And that is just a very basic summary of the main story of the first game. There's still DLC and many side quests that I didn't touch on. It's funny and important to note that this is arguably the most linear and most simple plot of all the games. Mass Effect 2, often considered one of the best of the trilogy, which I highly agree with, opts for an overarching plot of what is essentially a suicide mission, and you are given information about potential allies, and you get to choose whether or not you want to go on these missions to obtain these allies, and then you can go on another mission that gains their loyalty, but you don't have to do any of them. You get to choose who you want to recruit and who you want to be loyal to you. I'm not finished Mass Effect 3 yet, so I don't know what happens. Don't spoil it. From what I understand, a similar formula is used plot-wise. And then we don't talk about Andromeda. We don't talk about Andromeda. So don't worry, I'm not going to go into any more plot points <laughs> for the second and third game. I just did that to kind of prove my point that that was like a thousand words on my script. I barely touched the history that brought humans to space, like the first contact wars. I also didn't really touch on the nuance of the relationships between all the different races. And all of that is important exposition and setting information for the story. And like I said, if the game is going to be adapted at all, let's just be thankful that they're settling on a television adaptation and not a movie. The time provided with a long-term series will allow writers to actually take their time to establish the setting, providing that necessary exposition for this portion of the story, and get us excited for the story as a whole. The showrunners will have to decide if they plan to cover all three games, and if so, how are they going to do it? How many seasons are they going to use to tell this story? Are they going to do the story of Mass Effect 1 in multiple seasons? Are they just going to shove it all in one season, which I don't think is a good idea. I think they'll have to spread it over multiple seasons. But um, we just don't know. Second of all, and most importantly, a lot of the plot hinges on your choices as a player. Right from the beginning, you create your shepherd and decide who you want to play as, who your shepherd is, and who they will become. Generally, we tend to connect more to our avatars and their actions when they resemble us. So you can customize your shepherd to look like you, but you don't have to. There's something known as the Proteus effect. And the Proteus effect suggests that the visual characteristics and traits of an avatar are associated with specific behavioral stereotypes and expectations. For example, when you're customizing your shepherd, you get to choose their pre-service history and their psychological profile. You may make your shepherd a ruthless spacer. So they were a military brat that followed in their parents' footsteps and then became really mean. And then maybe you give your shepherd like a lot of scars and they're super buff. Or maybe you decide your shepherd began their life as an orphan on earth that fell into a life of petty crime and then turned their life around in the military and became a war hero. And I made my shepherd a goth space mommy. Anyways, these options not only affect your connection to your avatar and what they do, but it'll also affect some missions, stats, and dialogue options for you. 
I bring this all up because who they decide to cast as Shepard will make or break the series. By choosing a specific pre-service history and psychological profile, it may alienate large portions of their desired audience that don't identify that version with their Shepard. Not to mention, just choosing if they'll decide to do John or Jane Shepard will probably cause World War III. I know some gross ass men are going to be pissed if they decide to do Fem Shep or let alone someone who's not white. If they do cast a man, unless it is Henry Cavill, I'm not interested. Commander Shepard is a woman to me, to me. Creating your character is such a personal experience. You might have to stick with this avatar for three games and which ends up being what is around a hundred hours of gameplay. Unlike a brand new story with a blank slate protagonist, Amazon Studios will have to battle players preconceived notions of what they think Commander Shepard should be. I don't think there is a neutral way to do so, which is mostly why I think it'll never work. Psychology research also shows that players' relationships to their playable characters greatly impacts their choices in game and in real life in various ways. It's actually been proven that choices made in RPGs and TTRPGs, such as Dungeons and Dragons, have an effect on choices players make in real life. One of the biggest components of Mass Effect is its morality system. Each decision you make in the game essentially grants you either Aragon or Renegade points. So essentially all of your choices are made on a scale of good and bad. The more you get in either direction can affect your dialogue choices. It can even affect the entire end of the series. My personal play style is definitely a morally gray femship who ultimately decides to be good because that's what's interesting to me. But I know some people just like to make everyone suffer and do a full Renegade playthrough. What story will the executives decide to produce? Again, their choices can alienate certain and fans. For example, what if they decide to kill off Rex? I love Rex. I think that'd be criminal, but they could decide to do that. Or what's even worse, they could save Ashley instead of Caden, and then we have to stay with Ashley for the entire fucking series. I'd literally jump off a cliff. Similarly to those points, but possibly even more important, is who will they decide Shepard should fuck? I want full frontal alien nudity. I want a 10 minute sex scene with Garrus and Femship. That's what I want. Is that too much to ask? But what if we don't get that? But what if we get, what if we get male Shepard and Ashley? I just want to see Garrus and, and Jack and Thane. And those are all Mass Effect 2 romance options. They're not even available in Mass Effect 1. I'll settle for Liara, but I'll slit my wrists if it's Ashley. So all of these points basically boil down to the idea that this game hinges on choices. The vast narrative and replayability uplift the characters and setting, which is why the game is so fun to play. When you eliminate the choices, which they will have to do in order to create a cohesive plot or plot in general, you eliminate a lot of what makes Mass Effect Mass Effect. The reason why The Last of Us video game is one that can be successfully adapted is because the plot is linear. The plot does not hinge on choice. Joel is always going to save Ellie always. In Mass Effect, Commander Shepard is not guaranteed to do anything. The writers will be making choices that the players should make, and thus the story will not have the same effect. It's why other adaptations of video games don't work. When your story is partially written by your audience through their deciding what they want to see and what they think is interesting, you can't expect them to have the same amount of interest when you take their contribution to the story away. The Mass Effect series will just never work because of this. Finally, I just want to note that this series deals a lot with politics and race and morality. I don't want to see them ruin the nuance by not casting a diverse group of people for all of the parts. I would hate to see them turn it into American military propaganda. Like what if they decide to make Ashley and Udina these sympathetic characters and have us sympathizing with people who are essentially racists? What if they make all the aliens horrible and the audience hate them? I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I would just hate to see them write a story in which only humanity prevails. The beauty of Mass Effect is is the relationships between all of the alien races, how you get to gather this team of all different backgrounds to work together to save the galaxy. I just think it would be a shame if we lost this in favor of uplifting humans and war. And like, that's not the point of the story. Instead of celebrating differences and working together, it would essentially become a metaphor for the patriarchy and white supremacy, which is gross. So those are my thoughts. Regardless, if this series comes out, I, I will be watching. And hey, producers, if you want to cast me, that'd be great. I'll play Liara. Uh, please, I'll, I'll, I'll play anything. I'll do anything. Literally anything. Anything. Anything you need for this show. As always, let me know what you think. Would you like to see a TV adaptation of Mass Effect? What kind of story would you want them to write? Do you agree with some of the points I made? Do you think I'm stupid? 
let me know. Comment below. Anyways, I have to go finish my suicide mission in Mass Effect 2 and totally not just stare at Garrus for two hours. See you next week.